Good evening. This is Community Homeworks <laughs> virtual class this evening. My name is Jean Walker and I'm the Education and Volunteer Coordinator here at Community Homeworks. Tonight our presenter is Brett Huckabee, our Construction Manager. He's going to share his tips on what to do if your furnace isn't being cooperative. He's got great tips for you that hopefully you can use and not have to call a serviceman. Brett, are you set to go? Sure am. Hi, I'm Brett Huckabee. I'm the construction manager here at Community Homeworks. And uh, Jason asked me if we could present uh, this furnace troubleshooting. And more specifically, maybe some steps you can take before you call for service. Might save you a buck or two and uh, a cold night as well. <laughs> I appreciate everybody being here tonight and uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So uh, I, what I did was I broke some of the things down uh, that we commonly see into uh, various categories and of course one of the most uh, traumatic experiences might be if your furnace just won't start. So when your furnace won't start there's a couple of things you can check and just right off the bat you want to check your thermostat there are a multitude of different thermostats available uh, we actually have some graphics of um, some various thermostats if he wants to put that up there you can see there's very modern programmable thermostats uh, older thermostats uh, some that are in between and um, some that are programmable and some that are not okay you can take that graphic away uh, I actually have a couple here. You can see these are the old style. You'll notice this one, whoops, which one I got? This one right here, it doesn't even have a, a switch for air conditioning or anything. It, there's no switches on it. There's no batteries. It's just an old fashioned thermostat when you have heat only. So that's one type. So th this type, you would just wanna make sure it's above the room temperature. Sometimes we've gone out for uh, troubleshooting and discovered that the, they maybe had a place heater in the room, a space heater in that room. And the room was so much warmer than the rest of the house that the thermostat wouldn't even turn on. So that's one example. Uh, you might have a more basic programmable type like this. This is a Honeywell. Uh, these do have batteries. And you'll notice uh, many of these will have sort of a indication on the bottom where you can pop this thing open and it literally, this part will be mounted to the wall and your entire thermostat will come off in your hand and you'll see there's some batteries inside. Most of these types have a battery indicator on them that'll tell you that the battery's low. If you have no display whatsoever, your battery's probably dead. So that's something to try. I was gonna show you our, our actual thermostat here in our education center. Uh, I'm gonna try to do a little camera work myself here. So let's see how this works. So we have this um, also a Honeywell and uh, this thermostat does not have any indication of how to open it, but on investigation, you literally just pull the whole thermostat off the wall and you'll see on the back, there's the batteries. If you look closely, there's a couple little tabs that'll enable it to hook onto the top and you just shove the whole thing back on and it should resume working. You'll see right now our temperature in the building uh, right here is pretty cold. So the thermos, the furnace is not kicking on because the thermostat is set lower than the actual ambient temperature. So check your thermostat. That's a big one to remember. Uh, it's probably the most common call we get. And also remember if you have a programmable thermostat that the timing might be uh, set to where it reverts back to a temperature that you don't desire at weird times. So just make sure you read the manual and get your thermostat set up if it's programmable uh, to times when you might like to be uh, you know, around and have the heat on. Uh, the next thing is to check the switch on the thermostat. There's actually like a light switch on most thermostats. And um, I mean, I'm sorry, on most furnaces. And it's usually mounted right to the side of the furnace. We have kind of an unusual situation here because this is a newer install where our switch is uh, way over here on the wall and um, see if I can show it to you. It's back there in the corner actually mounted to our wall. Sorry about the movement. 
make you seasick. Uh, that's pretty atypical, but sometimes you'll find that the switch for your um, furnace is mounted maybe in a, an electrical box nearby or even like a small fuse panel nearby. Uh, so it, anyway, the power cord going from that source would go to the furnace. So you'll know that that's the switch for the furnace. Also take note that sometimes they're mounted horizontally, which means you might not know if the switch is on or off. Uh, most switches actually have it written on there, on, off. So just look at the switch and make sure it's in the on position. Somebody may have inadvertently flipped it off or something like that. So these things do happen and um, that can save you a lot of grief if it's simply flipping a switch. Um, then the other thing to look for is, uh, I'm going to move on, is, to, is unit getting power. This is a tricky thing to kind of check because um, different units, there's all kinds of different models out there and they have different ways of showing whether they have power. And some of them don't show that they have power whatsoever. It, there's no indication light. Uh, so you have to do some troubleshooting with that. Um, Basically, what you want to check first is the breaker um, in the panel, in your electrical panel. Uh, the breaker, if you have breakers, I'll cover fuses here in a moment, but the breaker is going to look something like this. And uh, it has an on-off position, but when they trip, they're often like right in between. So it's hard to tell that it's actually been clicked all the way off. Uh, so anyway, that's something to check in your panel. Now, if you go to flip that switch back on, uh, and just mind you, you have to flip it all the way to the off position and then back to the on position for it to reset. If it clicks right back off again, then you have a, a more serious issue. You probably have a short in the line or possibly a bad breaker. These things happen. Breakers have a service life and sometimes they just wear out. Uh, a short could happen from maybe somebody doing some work or maybe they bumped into a cord or uh, accidentally pulled on a wire or something that made it start to short out. So uh, check your breaker and if it resets and everything starts up again, you're okay and it was just a fluke. Otherwise, it might be a more serious issue where you actually would want to call an electrician for that to make sure that they can analyze your breaker and uh, make sure that it's okay. Uh, another option you might have is if your panel is an older variety that uses fuses. A fuse is a small device. It looks like this. It's like, it looks like a little light socket. It actually has printed on the top what it is. This is a 20 amp fuse. Uh, you might have a 15 amp fuse. Uh, don't ever substitute a higher amperage fuse for what's in there, but they actually have a small glass viewing portal and that little area right there, you can actually see the metal fuse. And if you look very closely, you might have to use a magnifying glass. Uh, it'll show that the, you might be able to see that the fuse is actually broken inside and then you'd need to replace this. That's a um, kind of atypical, but it's the same as a circuit breaker. It may have tripped just because it was old or burned out because of some sort of a surge, or you might have an electrical issue. And again, if it does, trip and it, it looks burned out to you, if you stick a new one in there, you screw it in like a light bulb. Um, and if it blows up and burns out again right away, then you've got a serious electrical problem and you need to call an electrician. Um, so we talked about the breakers, fuses, and the last thing I want to talk about with the power um, is that you might have inadvertently, they might have installed a GFCI outlet to power your furnace. This is atypical, but one of my first service calls with Community Homeworks was going to a house, they had no heat, it was freezing cold outside. And I went down to the basement and I looked at their furnace and it was plugged into a uh, GFCI breaker. I'm sorry, a GFCI outlet. These look like this. They have two small buttons on them, ones to test and ones to reset. I can't demonstrate because it's not actually wired right now, but all you have to do is push pretty hard on the reset button and it should reset that. If it trips again immediately, maybe this uh, actual outlet is bad. That happens too. So this is pretty atypical, but I've seen it a few times uh, since that initial service call. Um, and let's see, what else did I have on here? Um, oh, the last thing that can cause problems is 
and this is in regards to if the unit has no power, is if the cover is loose on your unit, it can actually cause the safety switch for when people service this, uh, your furnace, it can cause that switch to be open and it'll, it'll turn the unit off. I'm gonna show you on an older furnace we have. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit right now, I think. Um, basically, there's two main types of furnaces that you'll see. Uh, there's many varieties of heating equipment, but we're just going to touch on a few. Uh, our unit is what's called a high efficiency. You'll note that it has these white PVC tubes coming out of it. These are actually the venting, so there's no in, indoor venting on this unit. These both go up through the roof in this particular case. You might have an older unit like this one here, and you'll see that it is what we call a natural draft or it, perhaps it might be an induced draft, which has a fan inside to help it draft. These usually connect to some sort of chimney, uh, possibly just going straight up through the roof, uh, typically not through a sidewall, um, but they usually go straight up. What I was going to mention, though, was the cutoff switch. So let's see if I can get this cover off. Bear with me. Trying to do my own camera work here. <laughs> um, and of course, I don't have a screwdriver with me. Well, here, I'll just show you on, the, on our other unit. This one, the cover comes off like this. And if you see the cover is open, there's a little switch right here. And if this cover was for some reason a little cockeyed and not on there securely, that switch would trip open and your furnace will not fire. So make sure the cover is securely in place and that should solve that problem. Pardon me. Oops. Need a cameraman, but we're trying to avoid uh, contact with COVID and everything. So anyway, um, okay. So another reason why your furnace might not start is that uh, you might have a condensate drainage issue. Uh, these new high E furnaces have, um, they basically burn so, um, I'm sorry, they basically could create a lot of condensation that drains back into the unit, even with the furnace on. It's not necessarily, most people think of it as with air conditioning, but these actually generate condensation with the heat on. And um, most people will either have it naturally draining to like a floor drain or maybe even a, a drain under the slab in your basement, or you might have something like this. I'm gonna try to move this over here where we have this um, condensate pump. See if I can get a better angle on that. You can see that the furnace drains right into that little device there and that there's an actual tube, this tube here that goes up and we have this tube going all the way, I mean, it must be 50 feet away into a, into a utility sink. So you'll see that a lot of times, this pump, now, if that pump uh, gets blocked up or it starts uh, spilling out water, um, sometimes your furnace might have a shutoff switch that detects the moisture and will actually turn off. Not all furnaces have that. It's actually an add-on. So um, you might just have a bunch of water on your floor, and that's just something to check. So when you do that, um, you'd want to check the, the tube that's coming off of the the pump and make sure wherever it terminates, if it's in like a utility sink, that it's not all clogged up with mold and mildew and that sort of thing. Um, if it's gravity fed, it can also develop a blockage down near where the drain is just from accumulation of, um, uh, you know, mold, mildew and minerals and that sort of thing. Uh, so you just want to make sure that condensate line is, is clear. One thing you can do is, or you should do, is uh, periodically maintain those pumps. Uh, a simple way to do it that's kind of uh, just a basic uh, prevention measure is to pour uh, several cups of uh, vinegar into the pump. You'll see most of them have a small hole that can uh, has like a small plug on it that you can just pop out and pour the vinegar right into the pump until it starts to run and maybe flush it with a little bit more vinegar, let it run and that should help maintain that. They also sell like tablets you can put in those pumps. They sell solution that you can pour in there that's specially made for that. But the good cheap solution is just good old vinegar. 
and uh, the effectiveness is pretty good. So I think you could at least keep your pump running for the life of your furnace if you keep it up uh, with that. So uh, we talked about the condensate and now the, one of the big things that happens up here is your uh, outdoor vents might be blocked. On these um, high E furnaces with this type of uh, venting, many times it goes through the side wall of your house. So it goes out the side of the house. Mine faces my neighbor's driveway. And lo and behold, uh, when she blows her driveway with the blower when it snows a lot, it blows right against my house. And more than once, my external duct uh, op or vent openings have gotten clogged, like really packed with snow. So you'll just want to go outside if we have a heavy snowfall and your furnace isn't working there's a really good chance that if you have a high E furnace that maybe it got blocked from some snowfall or your neighbor's not doing you a service. <laughs> anyway, um, so that is another reason why your furnace might not start. Now, sometimes they will start, honestly, but it will just try to fire up and it'll just turn right back off. So uh, that's really usually indicative of some sort of vent blockage. So go outside, you know, put on the snow boots, make sure those vents are clean. If there's a bunch of ice packed in there or if it's accumulated ice from the condensation dripping, you'll want to break that out and clean that, um, that opening out from the outside. Okay, um, so what if your furnace um, turns off after it starts? So basically the first thing is the vents that I just talked about. You'll want to go check those vents because that's honestly the most common um, reason probably why, at least that we see why your furnace is just shutting off right after you get it started. So um, check the vents. Another thing is your furnace filter. This is really important. Uh, if your filter is very dirty, it makes your furnace work um, hard and sometimes it'll even overheat uh, to the point where it just will shut down and you'll start the furnace up. It'll run for a few minutes. You have heat and boom, it just shuts off again. Um, so just make sure to check your filter. I, I have a couple of examples. We often put in these large pleated filters. You'll see it's very thick. This is actually a, um, I believe this is a 16 by 25 by 5. You also might find a 20 by 25 by 5. They're usually some increment by 25 by, the 25 is a pretty common uh, dimension. So this is a, a larger furnace filter. It's a five inch, it's designed for six to nine months. So what I tell most folks is uh, you can change it every season. If you have, um, I'm saying like if, from when it gets cold to hot, if you have air conditioning, you'll wanna put a new one in the summer. And if you only use the heat or if you use the heat and AC, you wanna put a new one in the fall. Uh, it has a place where you can write the date that it was installed so you can remember how long it's been in there. Uh, make sure you observe the airflow. Uh, this is uh, uh, really important because it is something that if it's put in backwards, it can actually damage your unit. So look, when you pull the old one out, make sure you observe that. And I'm going to show you here on our unit so you can kind of get a better idea which way that thing's supposed to go. If you'll look, there's our furnace filter cage, and you'll see the large metallic ductwork coming in. This is going into the furnace, so the airflow is actually flowing this way. I'll pull that off. You can see that it has the airflow indicator right here. This literally just slides out and you just slide a new one in. Some of them sit at a funny angle, but just try to mimic what was there. And usually it makes sense uh, the way it's actually supposed to go into the uh, unit there. There's a lot of different types of filters. So I just wanted to cover that real quick. Um, so make sure you take note of what size filter you have. We sell them here. So by all means, if you need, uh, we basically sell them at cost. So uh, if you need a, one of these more expensive filters, by all means, contact us and we'll be happy to hook you up with one. They have some different varieties like this one is a two inch. And you'll see it's kind of hard to find the, what size this is. They just put a little indication on the, um, on the back here. Oops, where is that? See, I can't even find it. <laughs> Here it is. It says right there, 
20, 25 by two. They have 16 by 25 by two, 14 by 25 by two. Uh, there's other dimensions too. So just keep that in mind that your, your filter might be unique. You'll probably want to get a MERV 8 or better. Um, that's just good for air quality. And again, we sell these here at a discount. Another type might be just one of these thinner kind that are just a one inch filter. Again, it'll have the, um, the dimensions written on it somewhere. And uh, these also have an airflow direction. And you'll see it's just a little arrow on here that tells me which way the air is, you know, which way it's supposed to go into the filter cage. You might also have one of those kind of filters that you have to wash. They have some that look like a screen and you literally just take it out and you take, um, you know, hose or in your utility sink and you wash it, you know, try to wash the dirt back out of it because it's usually on one side. So make sure you're you know, blowing the dirt, not trying to force it through the screen, but actually out the back side. So change your filters, do it often. It's a huge, uh, important aspect of your furnace maintenance. Uh, we already mentioned the vent blockage. Uh, and just the last thing is that some of these uh, natural draft types, like this one right here, these stacks can also get blocked. Snowfall, uh, perhaps by um, a bird nest, all kinds of different things. Honestly, most of those units will still try to fire and run even with the blockage, but uh, you would still, you know, that's something to keep in mind that if your furnace is acting up, that maybe even your older furnace is um, blocked some way. And, and I should mention, I keep saying older, that they still make these types of furnaces. So you may have gotten a new furnace that's natural, uh, that's probably induced draft is what they would call that, uh, but they can have blockage um, as well. Another thing that can happen um, if it turns off after starting, like it, it seems like it's gonna run and you're like, okay, it seems okay, but then you never get any heat and then it just turns right back off is uh, possibly that the gas is turned off. Uh, this can be the gas to the house. It can be the gas to the unit. Um, there's various things that can happen. Um, Jason, can you bring up that graphic of the, um, the meter so that I can just show people outside. Yes, if you'll see, um, there's basically, uh, they show in this graphic where there's an on off position for a valve that's actually on the pipe next to your meter. Uh, if it has that barrel lock through it, then somehow your gas bill probably didn't get paid and they came out and turned off your gas. And they won't tell you sometimes, they'll just turn it off, put that lock on there. Uh, do you, did I give you another graphic for the, yeah, this one. Uh, you can see in this one that they actually show you like what position it's supposed to be in for on or off. And again, if you have that barrel lock that's locked in there, then contact consumers um, and tell them that there's either been a mistake or pay your bill. So I hate to say it like that, but that's what they do. They'll um, come out and cut that off and maybe not even inform you that that happened. Uh, so check outside. That's outside at your gas meter. Some people might even have a meter in their basement. Uh, that's an older configuration, but we still see that uh, occasionally. Um, the other aspect about gas that might cause your furnace not to run is if for some reason somebody cut off the valve, maybe you know your kids were playing around or something. Uh, yeah, we can lose that graphic. Thanks. And uh, this one, let's see if I can get this. This one we have a valve, let's see, right here. And you'll see that it is also in line with the pipe, means that it's on, and if I were to turn it like this, then it's off. We have just an auxiliary one here in case we wanted to hook up some other, you see that it's off right here. And uh, I will mention that like on our building, we actually have um, an extra valve on that line, like where they tapped into it. So you might have two valves on your gas line. So just make sure to trace the gas pipe back from your furnace that the gas line, the knob on the valve is in line with the pipe, whichever direction your pipe is going. And uh, you might just want to investigate and interrogate your kids if something, <laughs> if it was turned off. 
So, um, but maybe somebody was fooling with the furnace and they just turned it off because they, you know, were worried about a gas leak or something. And, and that's entirely possible. So if you smell gas, turn the gas valve off. Uh, if you get just a hint of gas smell, that's probably not much to be alarmed about. But if you really start to smell uh, gas, immediately shut that valve off because that's a serious issue and you'd want to call an HVAC professional right away. Um, so another thing that might happen is it'll you might have a bad thermostat. Sometimes we will have issues with thermostats that are kind of inexplicable. Um, it might show a faulty temperature reading or be communicating a faulty temperature reading. The batteries might be low, so it's kind of faulting out. Uh, there's a couple of reasons why that might happen. But uh, again, check the thermostat. And if it's a very old one, maybe it's just worn out and broken. So you might need a new thermostat. Um, some other likely issues that might uh, this, you know, happens quite often that um, your furnace will start up and it just uh, will turn right back off. It could be a bad flame sensor, a bad control valve, a circuit board, just to mention a few things. So all those things would be up to a service professional to fix. So uh, keep that in mind. And um, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next category. So um, what happens if you turn on your furnace and um, you've checked the thermostat, you've checked the gas, everything seems to be okay, um, but it's blowing out cold air? Well, first of all, you might want to make sure that it's set to auto and not just the on position. Um, let's see if I have one. If you'll notice on here, I don't know if you can see there or not, but there's actually an auto and an on. On just means that the fan is supposed to run all the time, whether the furnace is on or not. So you might be getting the sensation of like blowing cold air, but it's just because you have your furnace set on, which normally we would want to put it in the winter time anyway, on just on auto and just let the thermostat control when the air blows. Um, you also notice on this one, somebody blacked out the... Uh, cool for the ac they probably did not have ac so they just wanted to avoid anybody accidentally putting it into the ac mode and that would cause um yeah, obviously your furnace won't turn on if it's in the ac mode so you could try to turn up the temperature and you're stuck in ac uh, in the cooling mode and it, again it won't fire um so this one it, you know it, this one has an off position too in the middle and just to review some thermostats the older type might not have any switches at all and it's just up to where you set that thermostat the uh some other things that might cause uh it to blow but it's just cold air is that you might have a bad igniter or bad ignition system um it, on a modern furnace it'll show you a code that typically like a light pattern and i'm going to just show that to you right now what what i'm talking about most of these units have uh, let's see if you can see this. Well, it's hard to see in this light. I apologize. But if you look, there's an actual little port right here that has a light on it. Right now it's solid. And for this particular brand, that indicates normal operation. If it's blinking some sort of pattern, that would might indicate that there's an issue with the furnace. So basically you look for those patterns. Nine times out of 10, if your furnace is blinking a pattern, you're probably going to have to call a service professional unless you're um, really handy and can look up those codes and try to troubleshoot what's wrong. Each furnace manufacturer pretty much has their own set of codes, um, and they usually come in um, sort of like a long and short blinks of that light. It is a good idea to note those patterns so that when you call a service professional, you can say, yeah, my furnace is coding. It has a uh, one long light and then two short lights. Uh, it might be two shorts and one long. You know, it just depends on the manufacturer. But the point being that it'll actually blink and you can kind of determine the pattern because it'll do like a long, short, short, and then there'll be a pause, long, short, short. I'm just throwing that out as an example. But there, there might be, um, it might have four blinks and then one long one. Um, so just try to take note of what patterns you might see 
and um, write that down. That might help the uh, you know technician troubleshoot what's going on with your furnace. Um, so that's the that could be the anyway. Going back to the bad ignition system for a blows cold air, especially on older units, it, it, they might just blow and blow and blow and not know that they're not uh, actually firing the burners. Uh, of course, you want to check the gas supply. That's something that a lot of older furnaces will also blow and blow and blow, even though there's no gas going to them. So it doesn't know that it's not firing. Uh, that can happen. It, it less typical, but uh, so just check that. Um, I would like to mention about the gas supply that we recently had a client um, that had issues with uh, the furnace was coating, the water heater wasn't working properly, all these issues we were having. And uh, we determined, actually he determined that it might be something to do with the meter. And so lo and behold, he called consumers, they came out they determined that not only was the meter bad, but the line going to the meter that they own uh, was also bad. His house pipes were okay, but basically it was starving his appliances for gas and they were just behaving in weird ways uh, that were very intermittent, like it would work great sometimes and then it just would turn off. Um, and he actually came back from being gone all day when it was very cold recently and the house was almost down to freezing that could cause a lot of damage. Um, so, you know, you just want to be careful if you uh, have some problems that you guys can't diagnose and the technician, if you have an HVAC guy out there and he tries things, still has issues, might want to contact consumers and see if they can test your meter and determine if the pressure is adequate um, and if it has good gas flow, at least up to the meter. Um, another kind of less likely issue might be that you have a loose or non-insulated ductwork and that causes some cold air to blow. Usually that would just be like at the beginning of the cycle. Matter of fact, almost all furnaces will blow before they start to provide um, hot air. So you will get some uh, cold air blowing at first. And a lot of times that can be alarming to people like, oh, my furnace is messed up. But that's perfectly normal, especially if you have like basement, if the ducts are in your basement and it's very cold in the basement. Um, you can insulate and uh, air seal ducts that can help. Um, most times, it, mainly if it's like in an attic or something, you'd want to do that. And uh, mostly we don't see a lot of insulated duct work in basements, but of course it can be done. Uh, I do recommend if you... Um, want to go about sealing your ducts uh, that's just the seams where each piece fits together they're supposed to be taped but don't use you know what we call duct tape or duct tape the gray stuff that is not uh, applicable for hvac um, type of solutions uh, basically that stuff will dry up and fall off in a matter of years so it's not the best solution you'll want to get a product that's actually designed. It's a foil tape. This one actually has a little bit of mastic built into it, which is like a sticky, tarry substance that really seals those. Uh, this rolls about 20 bucks, but it's it's well worth it because you could probably seal up almost all your basement ducts with one roll. Uh, they have some cheaper alternatives too, but use a foil tape that's approved for HVAC applications. Uh, so that's a, a tip about uh, just sealing your ducts that you know, may or may not have anything to do with your furnace working. Uh, but if you do notice that um, you have a lot of leaky ducts in the basement and it's warm down the basement and it really shouldn't be, uh, you probably have some leaky ducts and you can fix it pretty easily yourself with just some good quality HVAC um, duct type tape. Um, so that's pretty much the normal issues that like maybe a homeowner could address um, that you could get through without calling service first. If you notice anything unusual, like I'm going to go into some other issues um, that you might find. Um, some things like you a cracked heat exchanger. This is a very serious condition that can occur. Uh, usually in older units, but honestly, it could be a brand new unit that has a manufacturer defect too. Um, this is a very serious safety concern because of the carbon monoxide that can actually cross into your air supply and that's going into the house. And um, basically, it, it's hard to tell as a homeowner, like if it actually has 
um, a cracked heat exchanger. Uh, some of them are sealed and you can't even look at them. Some of the older ones, you actually can like stick a mirror up in there and take a look, but it might be in an area that's not visible even with the opening and a mirror. Um, so basically if you smell a, like a funny burnt smell, um, that can indicate a cracked heat exchanger or a, a hole in the heat exchanger. If you notice any soot like around your vents, like the supply, the vents that supply the air into your house, if you notice any soot around the vent covers or kind of creeping up the wall, uh, that's probably indication that it's been damaged for some time. Um, some other issues that it might cause that odor though, just to be um, a little bit macabre, but it's like you might have a dead bird or a dead rodent in your system too. Uh, we've found them in high E furnace pipes. We've found them in the, um, the low E, I mean, you know, the old school um, natural draft systems. They can be in your duct work. I mean, it's just, it can be a real nuisance, but um, to actually find where the source is coming from, but that could also be a source of that. So don't be immediately alarmed if it smells not like burning, but it's like something else. Um, the other thing is um, you want to have a carbon monoxide alarm. Any house that has a combustible gas appliance, that's usually a water heater, a furnace, stoves. Uh, there's other appliances that might use gas, um, you know, like, like wood burning fireplaces might have a, a, a gas starter on it. Uh, any of these scenarios, we really all should have carbon monoxide detectors in our home. They are, um, by code required on one on each level. So that means one in the basement, one on your first floor, and if you have a two-story home, one in the upstairs area. Uh, read the manufacturer recommendations about where to mount those. Uh, there used to be a thought that you wanted to mount them low, but uh, carbon monoxide actually has uh, almost the same buoyancy as our ambient air. So there's no advantage to mounting it low. And a matter of fact, most of them ask that you put it up kind of more like where you would a smoke detector. Um, so that's something to keep in mind that we really should be careful with these gas appliances. Make sure you have your carbon monoxide detectors. It can really be the matter of life and death. Um, and, you know, uh, you want to check the water heater too and any other gas units uh, just to make sure um, that there's nothing. If you smell something, just go around the house and check everything because maybe you have backdrafting on your uh, water heater, for example, maybe it has some blockage or some issue. So uh, just, you know, be really cognizant that these devices can indeed kill us uh, while, it, you know, if, if they're not maintained properly or if some issue develops. Um, one last thing about the, some other issues that might occur just for your information is if your unit is very noisy, um, there, my, it could have a bad blower motor, and th this is a can be as, of concern because the bearings start to wear out, and it can actually cause so much heat that you might create fire or just some other issues with it. So, if you hear a very strange grinding noise or anything like that when the unit's running, I'd recommend shutting it off and calling an HVAC professional right away. Um, Another thing that might cause noise is some older units actually have sort of a belt drive uh, inside the unit and the belts can become loose, uh, kind of like, the uh, you know, on the on our old cars when you went to turn the power steering and it would squeak like that. So if you hear crazy squeaking or uh, bad rattling, grinding, these kinds of things, it's probably to do with the blower and that it's uh, some sort of defect with that that you'd want to get corrected. Um, and one other thing that I've noted on some jobs is that, th that there might be some debris in the uh, actual area. I'm going to show that to you right now, um, just so you can see what I'm talking about. So both, most furnaces have two compartments. Sorry about that. Uh, one above and one below. Typically the, now you might have one mounted horizontally, which you could still tell by where the name is about which is the top and which is the bottom. But when I open this up, you'll see there's this, uh, make sure you guys can see this. There's an actual big fan back in there. And see the power was cut. Normally before you do this, you'd wanna cut the power. I should have mentioned that. But um, really you might be able to look in from the filter box side 
So I would actually take my filter out, pull the whole thing out, and you'll notice I can actually reach in right here. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen uh, shredded filters that were put in backwards and they deteriorated from moisture and so forth. And the uh, pieces of that filter are actually um, inside the fan, uh, what they call a squirrel cage. It looks, it's kind of like a round fan uh, that looks like one of those, um, you know, hamster wheels. So uh, sometimes it, if it gets debris in there, that stuff will just rattle around and be kicked around for a long time. And that can do obviously damage to your fan. And those are very expensive to replace. So be careful about the direction of that filter placement. I think that pretty much concludes uh, most of my tips for, you know, what you can do to call about service. Um, I mean, before, <laughs> things you can check before you call for service. And um, I'd be open to any questions if anybody has any, and um, be happy to take any requests. Brett, what are the advantages of having one of the new Nest or Ecobee thermostats as opposed to any of the other kinds of thermostats? Yeah, the new thermostats are amazing. There's so many options. Um, you know, they call those like a smart thermostat. They usually connect to your smartphone and uh, to your Wi-Fi system at home. Uh, that way, when you're out and about, you can actually check your uh, phone and look at what temperature your house is and make sure your furnace is working properly. You can turn it up before you get home or turn it down. Uh, there's a lot of options with those type of thermostats. They're not for everybody. Honestly, we deal with a lot of elderly folks, and uh, sometimes, uh, you know, it just the complicated aspect of them. We don't often install them, but uh, there are many programs that where they're using those. But I, I think they're great. They're just um, they're not even that expensive anymore, and they really provide you with a lot of options when you're out and about. Do you feel they save money, or is it strictly? the gadgetry and the convenience of being able to operate it from your smartphone? Well, I think, uh, honestly, my opinion is that it's really more important to have uh, their, you know, the, the small thermostats are programmable. And the important thing is to have a programmable thermostat that can turn the heat. Like at my house, we turn it way down at night. We have it set to turn off at about 11 o'clock. And it, I think we have it set at 58 or something. And then uh, it, we have it to come in back on at 6 a.m. in the morning, back up to 68. Most of them are programmed in such a way that it actually reaches 68 by the time that you set it to tell it to be at 68. So it'll turn on a little bit early to bring you up to temperature. These programmable thermostats can literally save you a bundle. So they're really worthwhile. They're a little confusing at first. Um, what you'll notice is most of them have like a Monday through Friday setting in a Saturday and Sunday setting. And the Monday through Friday will have four times. It's a wake up, leave, return, and go to bed. And that'll you have to set that up for Monday through Friday. And then you set it up again for Saturday, Sunday. And it's kind of intended for people that are working. So you wake up 6 a.m. or whatever, have it set to 68. You leave at 8.30. You have it set back down to maybe 62. When you return home, you have it go back up to 68. And when you go to bed, maybe you have it turned down like we did, like we do down to 58. That made me think of a question and now I've lost it. <laughs> oh, there are seven day programmable thermostats also. You can buy a seven day one. That's true. Have and it might be simpler book. sometimes. Because in, in the older ones, I think we're like day by day. Um, and, you know, certainly if you get confused fooling with your um, programmable thermostat, you can always just manually touch the temperature, set it to what you want, and push the hold button, and it'll hold that temperature for you. Uh, but I do encourage people to try to use the, um, the advantages of a third programmable. Uh, I just think it, you'll save yourself some money, and um, they're not really that hard. Once you get them set up, you really just kind of forget about it. And they're not that hard to install yourself. 
Typically not. Sometimes, I mean, we have bumped into some strange wiring scenarios, but if your thermostat's working and it seems like it's okay, most of the time you can switch it out um, with the newer thermostat. They do require, if it's a very, very old thermostat, you might be out of luck. They might have to run a new wire to it. And what, oh, here comes a question. If deciding not to heat a certain room in the house, is there any precautions you would warn us about before taping off a duct vent? Well, that's a good question because sometimes maybe we have a room like that, um, a guest bedroom or something that we don't usually use. Um, some furnace systems actually on the duct work down in the basement will have like a lever on the duct and that lever can shut the duct off if you can figure out which one goes to that room. Um, and then if it's in the bedroom, you might have a register that you can close with like the little um, lever on the side. If, the, if that's damaged or doesn't work and you just want to tape it off, this shouldn't really cause any problems except for if you have plumbing. Um, certainly if, and if you don't know, you might not want to kill all the heat to that room. But uh, if a room gets very cold that has any plumbing pi pipes in the wall, obviously that could cause a problem if they freeze. Uh, so bathrooms, probably not a great idea to shut those off. And um, if you're not sure like where the pipes go, you might be able to tell from the basement if you have a basement. Um, but generally it shouldn't be too much of a problem because um, even though that's turned off, your house is still gonna maintain a certain temperature and some of that heat's gonna migrate to that room no matter what. I hope that answered your question. If not, please let us know. <laughs> I don't see a new question coming, so maybe we're okay with the answer. Thank you. Um, I know that at my house, I have turned off several rooms just because I don't use them. <laughs> it helps save a little on the heat. And sometimes it makes the other rooms warmer also. So, Yeah, it can definitely uh, force more air to other parts of the house, which might actually save you some money. Uh, besides just the idea that that room's not being heated, it can... Uh, definitely benefit you if you're not using those spaces and if there's no water lines in those rooms. <laughs> I know that if you are at all interested in one of the smart thermostats, do check with Consumers Energy. They quite often have had really, really good deals on them. Um, I think when I got mine, I paid maybe $40 for it, which is about a third to a fourth of what they cost in the store. Um, I had to agree to doing something, keeping the temperature below a certain level for six months, but it was like keeping it below 75. Well, <laughs> you know, it was something very easy to do. And they do, they did monitor it. So they, they are kind of, you know, checking that you are complying with what they asked, but to save that kind of money on that smart thermostat was well worth that program. Yeah, consumers often, uh, even some of our installers uh, get a free thermostat from consumers that are smart thermostats uh, intentionally to put in so that they can, um, you know, help us monitor our heat use and uh, energy use. Well, I don't see any more questions. Oh, I lied. What all supplies and services do you offer through Community Homeworks? I would assume for thir for furnaces. Um, well, in, in general, I think I can help answer that. We, we really don't sell much except for the filters. So uh, we can help you with your furnace filter. And even if you have an odd size, we can usually uh, order them for you. Um, so we do offer those at cost. So uh, you'd want to call our number. It's 269-998-3275. That's 269-998-3275. And uh, we can hook you up with a filter that way. Our services are, um, you know, mostly for lower income individuals. 
we offer all kinds of critical home repairs, everything from furnace replacements and repair, water heater replacements and repair, electrical uh, issues that we can address, uh, a whole bunch of different plumbing problems that we can often help with, uh, and some general carpentry. Uh, so basically every aspect of the home we try to touch on. Uh, we're not currently doing weatherization, which would probably tie into the furnace more than most, but we are planning on regenerating that program at some point and uh, offering that program as well. So right now it's mostly critical home repair um, of, you know, more typical type repairs, which mostly what we deal with is furnaces, water heaters, electrical problems, plumbing issues, and um, some general carpentry. And if you are one of our participants that I send you either a text or an email to remind you of our classes or other events, and you would like an application, just let me know and we will get one sent to you. The office is currently not staffed. We are all working from home, other than Brett, who has to come in and get things now and then. But um, we are taking applications. If you are low income and need some kind of home repair that you think we might be able to do, just please let me know and I'll be glad to talk to you about it and figure out um, if it's something that we can help you with. How are we doing time-wise on helping folks right now, Brett? We're pretty good. Uh, it's kind of hit or miss. Um, you know, we're, we do use subcontractors for the majority of our work, uh, and occasionally they're booked up. So we um, are kind of at their mercy a little bit. But I'll give you an example. Uh, I think last week, or maybe it was two weeks ago, we had a no-heat situation. And one of our wonderful contractors was able to get to them within, like, I think we got in within three days of them reaching out to us. So uh, sometimes it could be a very quick turnaround. Other times it could take a while. Uh, we can provide like space heaters and that sort of thing for interim if you have no heat. Um, so by all means, if you know anybody that is in need, no hot water, no furnace, and they just can't afford to get it fixed, please reach out to us. And please tell your friends and neighbors. It's just, it's not just for folks who have come to our class or are on our mailing. This, this is for city of Kalamazoo residents. We want to help anyone who is in need. Well, I now don't see any more questions, Brett. I'd like to thank you so much for sharing your vast amount of knowledge. I always learn something, even though, I've heard it several times. I always pick up with something new when you give us a great talk. Um, I'm so glad you're with us and stay safe and stay well and wear your mask and wash your hands just like everyone else. And if you're qualified, well, thank you very much. Not, make sure you sign up. <laughs> thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And uh, you guys have a good evening. Bye, everyone. Make sure you join us next week at the same time. We'll have another great class.